I would like to call the hearing to order this morning and uh, certainly want to thank our <coughs> witnesses for being with us. And uh, after opening statements, of course, I'll be introducing each one of you, and we certainly look forward to your testimony. <clears throat> uh, today's hearing, we're going to be focusing on the role of a diverse source of fuel for electricity generation. We frequently all hear a vocal chorus about the need for all of the above to meet our nation's demand for electricity at an affordable cost so that we can be competitive in the global marketplace, create a strong economy, and create jobs. But I, I think it's also important to be we be realistic. And we know that there are people in the administration, that there are leader, political leaders around the country, that there are national and international environmental groups, that there are nonprofit groups and others who really do have a desire to stop the use of fossil fuel in production of electricity. Uh, just yesterday, for example, Mayor Michael Bloomberg of New York. And I didn't say this, but the article said that he was gleefully writing the obituary for coal. And he was quoted as saying, it used to be said that coal is king. And regrettably, coal remains king in nations like India and China. But then he went on to say, here in the United States, I'm happy to say that the king is dead. Coal is a dead man walking. Now, the mayor says that he supports natural gas, <clears throat> but he gives millions of dollars to groups that want to uh, reduce the use of hydraulic fracturing. And, of course, he made his money, and he can spend his money any way that he wants to. But I think it's important that we have a national discussion about the reality of trying to eliminate fossil fuel as a source for electricity generation. Robert Mann, <clears throat> the Sierra Club president, was quoted as saying, fossil fuels have no part in America's energy future. Coal, oil, and natural gas are poisoning us. The emergence of natural gas as a significant part of our energy mix is particularly frightening because it dangerously postpones investment in clean energy at a time when we should be doubling down on wind, solar, and energy efficiency. The EPA, without question, has established an unmistakable trend line. Coal is being taken out of the national fuel mix, and EPA is methodically establishing a regulatory framework to dramatically reduce fossil fuel use throughout the economy. EPA's regulatory framework is taking fuel choice decisions away from the private sector while it bases those decisions on a single determinant, the environment, climate change, so forth, but ignoring equally important national goals of energy security, economic growth, lower consumer costs, and reliability, I believe will lead to serious problems in America. In fact, we've already seen signs of it. A few days ago, there was an article, which I have a copy here, that said California is one how to avoid a looming electricity crisis that could be brought on by its growing reliance on wind and solar power. Even though California has a lot of plants, it does not have the right mix. Many of the solar and wind sources added in recent years have actually made the system more fragile. Those are not my words. Those are the words of the author. And then in the New York Times, electricity prices in New England have been four to eight times higher than normal as the region's reliance on natural gas for power supplies has collided with a surge in demand for heating. This is a little harbinger of things to come. The Northeast is littered with coal plants that have been retired. Gas pipeline capacity is inadequate. And without nuclear power plant at Indian Point, New England would have been toast. And then we have the Energy Bill 2007 that prohibits the use of fossil fuel 
for providing electricity to government buildings, new and modified, by the year 2030. We have greenhouse gas regulations that will not allow you to build a new coal-powered plant in America if they're finalized, and now they're thinking about applying that to existing. So I think this hearing is a great place to have an honest discussion about the reality of trying to meet the electrical needs of America without fossil fuels, nuclear power, and those fuels that provide our baseload needs. I, for one, believe we do need all of the above. But I think that it's wrong that people in America and groups in America are trying to absolutely stop the use of fossil fuels. See, my time's expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. And, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for allowing the minority side to invite witnesses who can discuss renewables so that today's panel actually reflects on the title of this hearing. And we are hearing from a diverse energy source uh, base besides just coal and nuclear. Mr. Chairman, I believe in a truly all of the above energy policy. And fortunately, Mr. Chairman, we are need, indeed seeing more diversity in the nation's electric generation portfolio as we move towards more natural gas and renewable energy and away from our heavy reliance on carbon-intensive coal. In 1993, Mr. Chairman, coal was responsible for 50 percent of the electric generation in the U.S., while natural gas accounted for less than 15 percent. However, the Energy Information Agency reports that in 2012, there was indeed a shift in electricity generation away from coal-fired generation, which declined by 12.5 percent, and towards cleaner sources of electricity, including natural gas, which increased by 21 percent, wind generation, which increased by 16 percent, and solar generation, which increased by over 138 percent in just a single year. Mr. Chairman, due to this shift in 2012, coal accounted for 37 percent of the nation's electric generation. Natural gas accounted for 30 percent, 19 percent came from nuclear, and 12 percent of the nation's electric portfolio came from renewable sources, re renewable sources including solar, hydropower, and wind. In fact, Mr. Chairman, the wind industry experienced record growth in 2012, and for the first time, wind was responsible for the largest increase of adding capacity with 12,600 megawatts of added generation. Wind power is very important to my home state of Illinois, and in fact, there are up to 13 international wind companies headquartered in the city of Chicago alone. So I am very pleased to have witnesses here today who can discuss the important, importance of investing in renewable sources of energy whose costs continue to fall as capacity continues to rise. Mr. Chairman, the EIA also notes that U.S. energy-related combustion emissions was expected to decrease by 3.4 percent in 2012 to the lowest levels since 1994. This is a result of the increased use of renewable energy, the transition from coal to natural gas, and also due to the slow economic growth. While energy-related carbon emissions have declined 11.5% since 2005, there are still 
5.4% above 1990 levels. And Mr. Chairman, without significant policy action, DIE, DIA rather, expects U.S. carbon pollution emissions to increase by 6% between 2012 and 2040. This is precisely why the new source performance standards are so very, very critically important. These standards, which are mandated by law, will require new facilities to install the best demonstrated technologies while also taking into account costs and allowing states to show flexibility. Implementing these proposed standards will ensure that the power generation industry has regulatory certainty and will avoid penalizing companies who have made significant investments into their future while not allowing the can to constantly be kicked down the road. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to today's hearing, and I look forward to uh, the challenges and opportunities that are before us of maintaining fuel diversity in the nation's electricity generation portfolio. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't use that entire time. I have... Um, served in Congress and on this committee for over a quarter of a century. When I first got elected, we had wellhead prices on natural gas. We had the Fuel Use Act that said you couldn't use natural gas for a new power plant for electricity generation. Uh, the general economic model was that electricity generation was a natural monopoly and had to be regulated very heavily at the state and federal level. Uh, that has evolved in the last 25 years, and we're now at a point where we still uh, allow states that wish to to regulate their electricity markets, but we also accept that, that a true market can function, and in Texas, we have uh, deregulated the wholesale generation of electricity. We still regulate the wholesale transmission and the retail distribution, but we have a thriving uh, wholesale generation market in which we have uh, power plants, <coughs> independent power plants uh, f uh, that are owned by uh, uh, companies all over America uh, generating and selling electricity. We also have the largest uh, wind generation capacity in the country, and um, as a consequence of that, with the uh, subsidies that we've been providing to wind power, which I support to some extent, uh, have had the situation where uh, wind generators have priced their product negatively into the market simply to get the subsidy to keep their wind turbines turning. So uh, economic theory for electricity generation is a big deal, and we have an excellent panel today uh, to discuss where it is today. Uh, I look forward to hearing that, and would now would like to yield uh, one minute to Mr. Scalise of uh, Louisiana. Yeah. One of my colleagues for yielding, and uh, first, before we talk a little bit about all the above energy, we want to welcome Mr. Mole uh, for, for being here, uh, speaking on behalf of Entergy Wholesale Commodities. Entergy's a, a Fortune 500 company based in Louisiana. We're proud to have them there. Appreciate the work you're doing in, in nuclear power or specifically what you're going to be talking about, I believe. And, you know, when we talk about all of, what we mean is truly all of the different sources of energy. And, and when you look at the portfolio that this country uses today, the things that actually run America, that help us not only enjoy our daily lives and increase our, uh, our standard of living, but also to produce things. If we're going to be able to be a manufacturing country and, and actually create jobs here, it's going to take energy to do it. Uh, and under the current, uh, the current breakdown we have today, uh, 80 Roughly 87 percent of the electricity that's generated in this country uh, comes from, from coal, from nuclear power, and from natural gas. And unfortunately, all three are under attack by this administration. I mean, the, the war on coal has been duly noted. Uh, you know, you see so much coal being exported because you can't even use it in this country today, yet it represents over 37 percent 
of the electricity that's generated, uh, how you can continue to enjoy the standard of living we have as a country today uh, when, when the administration's at attacking 37 percent of that, that resource. And then in addition, it's all of the other things that, uh, that, that are produced in this country. You can't just do it on wind and solar. We support the advancement of those technologies. But when 87 percent of your electricity comes from the other sources and you're going after them, that's truly the government picking winners and losers. And ultimately, the losers are families who are paying higher electricity costs when this kind of policy goes into effect. So we're going to continue to push in an all of the above energy strategy. Uh, it's not only good for America. It helps families and it helps the ability for our economy to create jobs and compete. So I appreciate all the panelists today, especially you, Mr. Mole, for what what you have to say as well. And uh, with that, I yield back to uh, my colleague from Texas, Mr. Martin. I'm going to yield uh, the remaining time to Mr. Shimkus of Illinois. Thank you, uh, uh, Joe, for the uh, giving me the time. The, uh, all the above should be all the above. I, th I think my friend uh, Mr. Squeeze uh, said it well. You know, the state of Illinois is a 50 percent nuclear, 50 percent coal. So we, we have the benefits, but we're both being, I think, uh, disenfranchised in both those generating sectors. Natural gas, there's going to be a big natural gas plant in my state. It's, it's going to be very, very helpful. But that commodity product is going to go where that kind of commodity product can be used. Um, um, and I'll just end with high electricity prices hurt everybody. They hurt uh, jobs and the economy. They hurt the, the, the poor rural folks, uh, expensive gas and the like. So an all of the above strategy should be a lower cost fuel for everybody, whether it's electri electricity generation or liquid transportation fuels. Thank you, Joe. And I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's uh, subcommittee is going to look at the electric uh, utility industry and America's evolving electricity generation portfolio. Uh, there's no question that a significant transition is underway, and today's hearing is the first in a series. The uh, cheap natural gas is helping transform our electricity sector. This market reality is driving a shift away from the use of polluting coal to generate u electricity. Even boosters of coal acknowledge that it is not cost effective to build new coal plants today. State and federal renewable energy policies are paying off. We have doubled our capacity to generate renewable electricity from wind and solar in just four years. This has cut pollution and invigorated clean energy manufacturing. The cost of renew renewable energy is rapidly declining. Wind power is already cost competitive with fossil fuel generation in some parts of the country. And last year, for the first time, wind power added more electricity generation capacity than any other resources. Any other resource, nearly half of all new generation capacity comes from wind. These changes are positive developments, but we'll hear today that controlling carbon pollution would reduce the diversity and resilience of our energy supply. I have exactly the opposite view. In this committee, we like to pretend that there is no connection between how we generate our energy and climate change. But the fact is, climate change is the energy we face as a country. We can't have a conversation about America's energy policy, but also having a conversation about climate change. In November, the International Energy Agency concluded that if the world does not take action to reduce carbon pollution for 2017, that it would be impossible to prevent the worst effects of climate change because of the carbon dioxide emissions that would be locked in by the energy infrastructure existing at that time. That means the energy policy decisions that we make today will have a real and direct impact on whether we can prevent the worst impacts of climate change in the future. Every decision to build a new fossil fuel fire power plant poses climate risks. We need to understand and weigh those risks. Otherwise, we are going to be locking in infrastructure that will produce carbon pollution for decades to come or creating stranded investments that must be shut down before they have served their useful life. Ideally, this committee would listen to the scientific experts 
and enact a responsible energy policy that recognizes the reality of climate change. But as the President said in the State of the Union address, he will act if we don't. EPA's proposed carbon pollution standard for new power plants is a good first step. It is a fuel neutral standard that requires new plants to keep their pollution below a specified level. The proposed standard provides compliance flexibility and incentives for the deployment of carbon capture and sequestration technologies. Both natural gas and clean coal can meet this standard, which creates a level playing field for fossil fuel fire generation. Some utilities don't like this proposed rule. The question we should ask them is how can they reconcile unrestrained and ever-increasing carbon pollution with the scientific reality of climate, climate uh, change. I'm glad we're providing a forum to hear from the electric utilities today. I know we're going to have a second hearing to hear from federal and state electricity regulators. That will help us get another valuable perspective on the issues facing the electricity sector. But we also need to hear from the scientists who can explain to us why PA, EPA should take action to address climate change. Uh, Chairman uh, Whitfield, I'd like to make a request at this time that you schedule such a hearing as the third in this series to ensure that the subcommittee hears all sides of the issue. If you want an all of the above uh, portfolio, well, we've got to have policies that will encourage alternatives to the fossil fuels. And uh, by denying the tax breaks for wind and solar energy, by subsidizing uh, oil, by ignoring the full consequences of fossil fuels and the impact they have and the cost they have on public health and the environment, we are not giving a level playing field. Uh, we are skewing our policies uh, to more fossil fuel pollution that will cost us in the climate uh, problems for years to come. Yield back my time. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our uh, witnesses. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of witnesses. I'm going to introduce all of them except for one, and then I'm going to call on Mr. 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 Chairman, may I just comment that, that, that I wished I could stay here for, to hear all the witnesses. I get a chance to review your testimony, but we have several subcommittees meeting at the same time, so I'll be back and forth. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. First of all, we have Mr. Mark McCullough who is the Executive Vice President, Generation at American Electric Power. We have Mr. William Mole, who is the President of the Energy Wholesale Commodities that Mr. Scalise referred to. Uh, we have Mr. Benjamin Falk, who is President and CEO of uh, XL Energy. We have Mr. Mark Gerken, President and CEO of American Municipal Power. Uh, we have Mr. Robert Gramlich, who is the Interim uh, Chief Executive Officer of the American Wind uh, Energy Association. And at this time, I would like to recognize a gentleman from uh, Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for the introduction of our last uh, witness. Thank you. I want to introduce uh, someone I consider a friend. His brain electrical generation issues. They come up, and that's uh, 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 from the power, Don McClure, Nebraska Public Power District. He's the VP and General Counsel of Nebraska Public Power, a very diverse energy. Yield back. That was a wonderful introduction, Mr. Terry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once again, welcome to all of you. And I'm going to call on you, and each of you will be given five minutes. And there is a little box on the table that will turn red when your time is up. And Obviously, uh, we'll let you go over a little bit, maybe, but not too far. But Mr. McCullough, thanks for being here. We look forward to your uh, testimony. Good morning, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and Distinguished Members of the Committee on Energy and Power. Thank you for inviting me here today and for this opportunity to offer the views of American Electric Power on this very critical issue. We applaud your efforts to examine energy diversity and are encouraged that you have identified the importance of innovative technology as part of the solution. AEP has long been an industry leader in technology development and fuel diversity planning, which has led to dramatic improvements in the reliable, efficient, and clean production and delivery of our product. 
Recent AEP initiatives include Mountaineer Plant's 2009 startup of the world's first carbon capture and storage demonstration at a coal power plant, and the commissioning of an ultra-supercritical uh, John W. Turk coal power plant, one of the world's most efficient coal power plants. AEP has also de demonstrated industry-leading technologies in energy efficiency and grid intelligence. Energy diversity plays an important role in reducing the potential exposure of our company and our customers to major fluctuations in markets, costs, regulations, and electric demand. This allows for the use of the lowest cost resources possible while enabling rapid response to demand changes. However, policies that could prevent the construction of new baseload generating units or force the retirement of existing capacity could lead to significant shifts to this balanced energy mix and reduce capacity diversity. For example, the proposed CO2 NSPS for new sources effectively prohibits the construction of any new coal-fired power plant because of the lack of a commercially available CO2 control technology. Due to these regulations, as well as numerous other challenges facing nuclear energy, our nation's electric grid will become increasingly reliant on a single few fuel for our new base load generation capacity likely eliminating both diversity and flexibility in new power plant builds. Federal policy should support fuel diversity, not preclude it. The importance of fuel diversity cannot be overstated. Too great a reliance upon any one energy source creates a significant risk of exposure to electricity price spikes and supply disruptions. Among other benefits, coal and nuclear plants buffer against fuel supply disruptions because they can inventory months of fuel on site, a fundamental value to any energy security solution with national security benefits. Over the past 12 years, AEP has added more than 5,000 megawatts of natural gas fuel diversity, enabling our company to switch between fuel sources based on price fluctuation. While we recognize the value that natural gas brings to the diversity equation, AEP is concerned that a prolonged dash to gas will lead to over-reliance on one fuel and have adverse consequences for the balance and diversity of the power sector and the economy. With the current low cost of natural gas, coal, and uranium, now is the ideal time to look to the future and adjust the focus of technology development to truly innovative, revolutionary paradigms for energy conversion and use. We support commercialization of small modular reactor or SMR technology for the next generation of nuclear power. For fossil fuels, the United States must invest in technologies that show promise of a step change move of the needle regarding cost, fuel efficiency, and environmental performance. With success, technologies like chemical looping and other new revolutionary technologies will enable our next generation of power plants to use coal with extremely high efficiency and ultra-low emissions while producing a pure stream of CO2 with no added energy penalty. These technologies can open the vast yet untapped oil reserves in this country to enhanced oil recovery production by making enormous quantities of low-cost CO2 available for EOR purposes, bringing, bringing an even higher level of energy security. However, these technology innovations required to now enable industry overcome the cost of commercialization. Increasingly, stated in Kirk Free Technology Road, the necessary funding to develop and commercialize these concepts is not beyond the levels invested in recent years with DOE's fossil energy clean coal programs. This funding just needs to be focused on the proper technologies. Similarly, SMR development could address nuclear risk that prevent its broad deployment today. In summary, AEP urges the development of federal policies that promote fuel diversity to use gas, coal, nuclear, and renewable energy, energy in revolutionary ways that minimize volatility and environmental impacts while increasing energy efficiency. This not only addresses energy and economic security in the U.S., but brings technology solutions to the globe where real emission impacts can be realized. It's important as U.S. is now less than 12 percent of global carbon, global carbon emissions, and it's getting less every year. Thank you, Chairman and members, for the opportunity to participate in this important hearing. Thank you, Mr. McAuliffe. And uh, Mr. Mole, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Good morning, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, Vice Chairman Scalise, and members of the committee. My name is William Mole, and I'm the president of Entergy Wholesale Commodities. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the importance of nuclear generation to a diverse electricity generation portfolio. My company's view and my personal perspective is that all fuel sources have something to offer, and a diverse portfolio is key to a reliable, and electric, reliable electric grid. This general approach to national energy policy is consistent with the supply planning principles of many electric utilities, where generation portfolio decisions reflect a consideration of numerous factors and numerous risk. Entergy is one of the largest nuclear operators in the United States. We currently operate 11 nuclear power facilities in New York, Vermont, Mich Michigan, Massachusetts, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Entergy was the first U.S. utility to voluntarily stabilize greenhouse gas emissions and has earned local, national, and international recognition for its leadership on a wide range of issues, including those related to environmental policy and corporate governance. Nuclear plants are an essential part of this nation's energy portfolio. Regional electric grids require a mix of baseload, load following, and peaking facilities. While each regional electric system has its own unique characteristics, in general, coal and nuclear power plants have long supplied baseload power, while natural gas-fired units have been used as a predominant source of load following and peaking capacity. There are 103 operating nuclear power plants in the United States, generating approximately 20 percent of the nation's electricity. Those nuclear plants operate as baseload, high-capacity factor units that power and help stabilize the electric grid in or near many major American cities. Throughout the nation, nuclear generators help keep wholesale electricity prices lower than they otherwise would be. A simple way of looking at the economic value of the existing nuclear generation fleet is to consider the potential cost of replacing it. Using data from the Energy Information Administration, we've calculated that replacing the 100,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity with new combined cycle technology gas plants would cost more than $100 billion. To put that number in perspective, in 2011, American utilities invested slightly more than $30 billion in transmission and distribution facilities, less, less than one-third of the nuclear for combined cycle replacement cost. Moreover, this replacement cost estimate does not include any costs of expanding pipeline capacity to serve new gas-fired plants. The adequacy of pipeline capacity is a key consideration as was recently demonstrated in New England. Nuclear power is also a crucial contributor to maintaining America's air quality. Nuclear generation pr produces virtually no carbon emissions. Since 1995, nuclear plants in the U.S. have prevented the release of over 11 billion metons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As reliable sources of generation, nuclear plants provide a function in the power portfolio to support emerging wind and solar products, which are characterized by intermittent availability. Safe operation of our facilities is our top priority. Energy has made capital invest more than 300 million upgrades to and security systems at its northeast and midwest merchant nuclear plants. We ensure safety and security through a defense in depth approach that integrates constant training, robust design, multiple layer of redundant safety system, comprehensive plant security, and detailed emergency planning. We believe the fuel diversity, economic reliability, and environmental benefits of nuclear power are clear, but every source of energy has advantages and disadvantages. The bottom line is that America needs a balanced portfolio that includes all existing generation technologies while continuing to focus on the development of new technologies for power supply resources. Nuclear plants are a critical part of that diverse portfolio and provide critical reliability, economic, and emissions benefits
to the United States. To preserve those benefits for the public, we have to maintain our primary focus on safety while engaging with policymakers and especially regulators to ensure that market rules foster open competition and that regulation is rational and evidence-based. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Moll. Uh, Mr. Folk, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Ben Folk, and I'm Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Excel Energy. We're a public utility holding company headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We serve 3.4 million electric customers and 1.9 million gas customers in eight states throughout the upper Midwest, Colorado, Panhandle of Texas, and New Mexico. The topic of today's hearing could be not be more important at this critical juncture in the energy sector. We all share the goal of satisfying the country's growing energy demands in the least expensive, most reliable, and cleanest way possible. Excel Energy has been successful in pursuing a strategy that has reduced customer risk and promoted clean energy while maintaining reliable service at a competitive price. Fuel diversity is an important part of that strategy. Our system is a strong example of an all-of-the-above strategy. Cell Energy owns a power generation fleet that includes more than 17,000 megawatts of electrical capacity from sources including coal, natural gas, nuclear, wind, hydro, biomass, and solar. We are unique among utilities in our commitment to renewable energy. Today we have about 4,900 megawatts of wind on our system. We're also leaders in energy efficiency and innovative state emission reduction and fleet modernization programs. Our strategy has put us on track to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions over 20 percent from 2005 levels by 2020. At the same time, we've been able to maintain power prices at or below the national average. We are achieving these remarkable results by maintaining a robust, diverse system. Although clean energy plays an important role in our electric system, we do continue to rely on coal and nuclear power plants to provide the low-cost base on which our system depends. These reliable energy sources have not stood in our way uh, in our environmental achievements. Our, our, our company has been able to achieve significant emission reductions despite the recent uh, addition of Comanche 3, a large coal plant in Colorado. We're also in the process of extending and upgrading our three nuclear plants for another 20 years of service. Coal and nuclear energy remain critical to the efficiency and reliability of our system. For that reason, we've been proactive in seeing the need to either invest in coal fleet improvements or to retire and repower aging coal plants through programs like the Colorado Clean Air Clean Jobs Act and the Minnesota Emissions Reduction Program. Like many utilities, we've taken advantage of low natural gas prices to serve growing customer demand and allow replacement of aging coal plants. However, because of our renewable portfolio, we've been able to avoid becoming too reliant on natural gas. Wind energy acts as a natural hedge against fuel price risk, reduces our emissions, customers can clean it. In fact, wind is our strategy. We recently contracted for wind power in Colorado, a price that is competitive with natural gas fire generation, even at today's low prices. As a result, we're creating wind, which we've never before imagined. Up to 7% of our energy in Colorado in the hour. Annual, uh, average wind energy will reach 20% this year in Colorado and 14 percent in Minnesota. Now, the integration of renewables is manageable, but it's not free. At the penetration rates we've achieved and look to expand, our customers bear increasing costs of ensuring system reliability. With the help of the development community, we're working to work modify federal reg renewable pump sure so directly facilities responsible for integrating our system by extension their customers. Importantly, these changes, which we call the Customer Renewable Credit, would constitute just a small fraction of the current cost of federal incentives flowing to renewable energy. Now, much of our diversification strategy results from our long-standing desire to prepare for federal regulation of carbon dioxide emissions. 
without passing judgment as to the wisdom of such regulation, we do believe there are principles that should guide government action in this regard. These principles include the belief that legislation is better than regulation, state flexibility is key, and early action, early action credit is essential. Because future legislation is uncertain, we are preparing for EPA's regulation of carbon dioxide from existing power plants. We hope that the EPA will allow states to develop diverse emission reduction strategies like those that have been successful in Colorado, Minnesota, and elsewhere. For my company, it's most critical that carbon dioxide regulation gives credit to states and energy companies that have already acted early to address carbon issues. Many customers are already paying for clean energy programs and should be re rewarded for having done so. We believe with these approaches to policy, the nation can assure continued diversity of its energy resources and, and achieve what Excel Energy has been working towards in our states for more than a decade, clean energy, environmental improvement, and a competitive price. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Folk. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gurkin, you're recognized for five minutes. Good, good morning, um, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and, and the subcommittee members. I'm Mark Gurkin, CEO of American Municipal Power, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the, the importance of the electric uh, sector's uh, fuel diversity. My remarks will focus on the role of hydropower can play in these diverse resource portfolios and also the challenges that are faced in the development process. Ohio-based AMP is a wholesale power supplier and service provider for 130 municipal electric systems in seven states. Collectively, AMP has serves more than 625,000 meters and has had a system peak in 2012 of 3,500 megawatts. Last year, AMP had power sales revenue of about $775 million and total assets of about $5.5 billion. AMP is currently constructing four hydro projects on the Ohio River at existing U.S. Corps of Engineers locks and dams. These projects total more than 300 megawatts and a $1.6 billion investment, uh, which represents the largest deployment of run-of-the-river, new run-of-the-river hydropower in the country today. One of our projects is the Smithland Project in Chairman Whitfield's district. Another is Willow Island Project in Representative McKinley's district. The power from these projects will benefit our members and districts of dozens of uh, members of Congress, including Representatives Griffith, Blatta, and McKinley. Importantly, AMP's projects are resulting in around 1,200 jobs through a period of four years, as well as contracts with major vendors in over 12 states in this country. Our hydro projects are part of AMP's overall, above uh, all of the above energy strategy, which embodies the importance of fuel diversity. AMP works with the nationally recognized firm of SAIC to develop strategic long-term power supply resource, resource plans for each one of our members. And that's a key component in our ability to undertake generation investments in that our members are able to take a longer-term look at these investments because they care about the long-term future of their customers. Um, AMP, works, or AMP has long used the term diversified to describe our portfolio, which includes own, operated, and purchased output from natural gas, coal, hydropower, wind, solar, diesel, and landfill gas generating facilities, as well as strategic wholesale market purchases and a robust energy efficiency program. Our projects represent fuel, technology, and geographic diversity and will yield long-term risk-balanced portfolio with predictable rates. Run of the River Hydro uh, projects are capital intense but have many positive attributes. As I listed on pages 7 and 8 of my uh, written testimony, I would ask you to look at those because I think, I think as a renewable, hydro does itself apart from wind and solar when it comes to uh, load detach and other things. One of the more, of, of, of the more than 80,000 nights, the more than 78 gigawatts of hydropower available today are probably by just percent of the dams. In an April 2012 report by DOE's Oak Ridge National Lab, founded at the adding power, National Dams has the potential to add 12 gigawatts of new capacity. Additionally, the National Hydropower Association job study shows that between 230,000 and 700,000 jobs could be created through the development of new hydropower. Despite hydropower's uh, positive attributes, the role is a diverse energy portfolio and the process from inception to construction for the new facilities is extremely challenging. Most developers don't enter the regulatory process with unreasonable expectations. We understand the need to balance the environmental protection with development. 
one of the key challenges is to keep costs down and stay on schedule, which makes the regulatory process very critical. Developers must carefully time the required modeling studies, the site assessments because the studies have seasonal and weather limitations. A hydropower, a hydropower developer must also have significant capital, millions of dollars for larger proje projects to cover the cost through permitting. Of the, of the regulatory process, we found that the critical path sometimes is strictly the PJM interconnection in our case uh, of, uh, that could take 24 months and commonly uh, is uh, filled with delays in that process. AMP, AMP's experience has been uh, with hydropower projects on non-powered uh, core dams. Key regulatory approvals are FERC license and the core 404 and 408 permits. Some of these studies required, are required in the FERC process are, are repeated in the core process. In order to obtain a 404 permit, applicants must demonstrate that the discharge of dredged and fill material will not significantly inter, uh, impact or degrade the national waters, and, there is no, and also that there is no practical alternatives to damaging the aquatic environment. Prior to the issuance of the 404 and 408 permits, approvals must be provided by the Corps to ensure that the lock and dams are not compromised. AMP was the first entity uh, required to obtain a 408 uh, a permit in lieu of, as well as the 404 permit. We saw considerable delays. Um, we witnessed uh, delays in financing, which cost us significant dollars, and we see the need to streamline that process. What can be done to improve the process and bring more hydropower online is to help diversify the national energy portfolio. AMP is pleased that a bipartisan legislation sponsored by Representative Morris Rogers has been favorably considered in the House. The Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act will improve the process for smaller hydropower projects and require study of additional improvements to a broader scale. I believe that fuel diversification is paramount to our nation's energy uh, security. This includes ensuring that reliability and affordability are considered in rulemakings, impacting existing generation resources, and that more efficient regulatory processes are in place to help facilitate the development of new infrastructure to meet our nation's energy and capacity and reliability needs. I commend the subcommittee for reviewing this topic, and I wish uh, thank you very much, and we'll be happy to respond to questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gherkin. Uh, Mr. Gramlich, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to represent the views of the American wind energy industry. As you've heard today from the electric utilities on the panel, uh, diversity is a, is a crucial issue for the electric industry. Uh, as you've also heard, uh, when utilities seek to diversify, wind power is a natural choice. Wind power tends to be the next least cost uh, source of new generation capacity behind natural gas. It serves as a natural hedge or insurance policy because its fuel price risk is zero. Wind energy production has grown dramatically in the last decade. Today, wind projects in 39 states and Puerto Rico offer enough energy to power nearly 15 million American homes. At least 66 electric, electric utilities bought or owned new wind power installed in 2012, up 50% from just a year ago. Last year alone, $25 billion in private investment went into building new U.S. wind projects. Wind projects in the U.S. have brought economic growth to, your, to rural communities, roughly $400 million in property taxes or similar payments to communities, and annual payments to farmers and ranchers of around $120,000 per turbine over the term's lifetime. Already, I South Dakota enough wind energy to meet more than 20% percent of their electricity needs and wind energy produces 10 percent of the electricity in nine states. Grid reliability benefits greatly uh, from fuel diversity. Just like the Mississippi River takes water from many states and tributaries and keeps a steady flow into the Gulf of Mexico, the grid takes power from many sources to meet total demand. The grid can, can provide reliable energy as long as enough power is available from a diverse generation sources across the wide geographic area of our power. Wind power has been an important part of that diverse portfolio, providing energy at many geographic points around the grid, helping grid operators meet demand. Diversity promotes reliability because there is operational risk for all resources on the system, whether it's from a mechanical failure or natural causes. In many cases, what affects other resources does not affect wind energy. Wind turbines continue to operate after Hurricane Sandy, the Japanese tsunami, and the freak cold snap in Texas in February 2011. 
During the Texas cold snap, some 50 conventional power plants abruptly shut down due to, due to the cold weather, contributing to rolling blackouts, but wind turbines continued to produce as expected. Water savings from wind energy are another important benefit for utilities and policymakers, especially with large parts of the country still facing a persistent drought. Fuel diversity requires continued attention and support from Congress, utilities, and state regulatory commissions. Without that attention, there would be a tendency to rely on a single resource or effectively put all of the nation's electric resource eggs in one basket. At the federal level, the primary means of supporting fuel diversity has been tax credits. Tax credits played a major role in bringing down the cost of shale gas, and they're rapidly bringing down the cost of both wind and solar energy. The U.S. wind energy industry is now getting back to work building turbines and projects after the recent extension of the production and investment tax credits. The primary challenge is that rene renewable tax incentive support has been sporadic and unpredictable. With more policy certainty, like that enjoyed by other energy sources, the wind energy industry could invest in the remaining cost and performance improvements needed to finish the job of becoming fully cost competitive. Diversity through wind power development has held rates down for homes and businesses across the country. Wind energy costs have fallen by one-third in the last four years, and the technology continues to improve. Over the long term, wind energy's zero fuel cost protects consumers from fluctuations in the price of other fuels. Wind power is an important component of a diverse domestic energy portfolio that promotes economic growth, energy security, and a clean environment. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McClure, you're recognized for five minutes. And be sure and turn your microphone on if it's not. Good morning, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the committee. I'm John McClure, Vice President and General Counsel with Nebraska Public Power District. I'm here today substituting for our CEO, who unfortunately uh, broke a bone on Sunday and was unable to travel. I appreciate being able to appear before you today to discuss some of the significant challenges facing the electric utility industry. Everything we do in society, whether it involves commerce, communication, comfort, or convenience, has one or more crucial ties to the electric system. Consequently, it's imperative to understand the, cru the consequences of policies and regulation since electricity usage impacts everything we do. I'm here today on behalf of the Alliance for Fuel Options, Reliability, and Diversity, or AFFORD as we call ourselves. We're a group of consumer-owned electric utilities serving in 14 states and have recently published a white paper which details our concerns. Our message is simple. There is no single option for producing electricity, and due to regional differences and other considerations, public policy Excuse me. Uh, public policy should encourage electric utilities to pursue diverse fuel mixes that account for local, regional, and national circumstances. A one-size-fits-all energy policy will not work in the electricity sector. Sector. The chart in the back of the room does a great job describing how different the regional mixes are around the country and that's worth 10,000 words that are not in my testimony in terms of educating us about the diversity around the country. Uh, NPPD is primarily a wholesale power supplier. Uh, we have a diverse generation mix, especially compared to those in our region. Uh, the proximity of cost warming low sulfur coal, coal is a popular choice for fuel. So large utilities in the region receive 75% or more of their electricity from coal-fired generation. At NPPD, we get approximately 60% from coal, with the remaining mix being near hydro, wind, and natural gas. For the past years, NPPD has been planning for the future. We began a stakeholder process design a dialogue about the choices and consequences of power supply and demand-side options. We found customers expect the following from their power supplier, affordability, high reliability, fast outage restoration, and environmental stewardship. Achieving all of these is no simple task, as some choices may serve one or more of the criteria, but may challenge others. The final product of our effort will be a new integrated resource plan and must consider all of the uncertainties facing our industry. Some of the key drivers of uncertainty include future regulatory requirements for fossil fuel, nuclear, and renewables. 
One specific uncertainty involves the future price of carbon emissions. As you well know, a number of utilities have decided to close older, smaller coal plants because the known cost of more stringent environmental regulations and the unknown cost of future carbon restrictions is deemed either too high or too uncertain to continue with coal. You also know that natural gas is the current fuel of choice for new generation. Its environmental characteristics are superior to coal and its widespread development has created a plentiful near-term supply with attractive pricing. While the supply and price of natural gas has been a game changer and it's a critical part of a diverse fuel mix, it's not a silver bullet. What many do not realize is that coal remains a more competitively priced fuel for certain regions of the country due to the proximity of supply, especially in the central and western U.S. Natural gas may be a great option if your power plant is located near a robust network of gas pipelines, but unfortunately many of the existing coal plants do not have access to pipeline capacity to convert from coal to natural gas. As was mentioned earlier, we've been through other periods of major changes. At one time, uh, gas was taken out as a fuel option. Now many of us are concerned coal is going to be taken out as a fuel option. We need all of the above. As the owner and operator of a nuclear power plant, we believe this too must be part of our nation's mix. Nuclear is an important part of a carbon-free generation mix. Wind and solar receive considerable attention and like many other fuels are significantly impacted by natural regional attributes and infrastructure availability. Some of the areas with the greatest wind potential are relatively remote and, limit, and have limited transmission. In summary, as you work through these challenging issues, it is critical that policies be developed that promote reliability and affordability through fuel diversity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. <laughs> oh, Ms. McClure, thank you, and uh, thank all of you for your uh, testimony. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize myself for five minutes' questions. Uh, Mr. McCullough, you had mentioned the Turk plant in Texarkana, Arkansas, and I would ask you, uh, from the time you obtained the first permit or applied for the first permit, how long, how long did it take to uh, complete the construction of that plant and begin operation? We applied for the first, first permit in the fall of 2006, and uh, the unit went commercial in um, December of 2012, so over six years. And that, now, is that technology, would you say that's one of the cleanest coal-burning plants in America? It is. Would you say it's one of the cleanest coal-burning plants in the world? It is. And you know, our carbon emissions in the U.S. are the, the lowest point in 20 years. <clears throat> And um, as someone indicated in their opening statement, the U.S. today has less than 12 percent of global emissions. We're responsible for less than 12 percent. With that ability to build a plant that clean, if the greenhouse gas regulation, when it becomes final, would you be able to build that plant in America today? Uh, we would we would not build that power plant. And you would not after. legally be able to meet the emission standards, would you? Um, I can't answer that question entirely. That may be true. Um, the economics of, of the overall situation, uh, when you add CCS to Turk, yeah. because CCS would be required, it's not commercially available. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> we would not be able to. This is the first time that EPA ever required one fuel source to meet the standards of another fuel source. So standards. So, <laughs> to bother me, all of us can stop about all of the above, but we do know that there is a concerted effort by groups, individuals, and others in the country to eliminate some fossil fuels from being used for generating electricity. And, uh, of course, I, I'm from an area of Kentucky that uses a lot of coal, but it's more than just that. As I, in my opening statement, I talk about in New England, they're talking about how natural gas prices is eight times higher because of lack of uh, pipeline capacity. And Mr. Mole, you talked about the importance of nuclear energy, and yet they're talking about in New York State, they're trying to close down the plant, the nuclear plant, that if that were not an operation, as they say, New England would be toast. And then in California, it talks about 
California is weighing how to avoid looming electricity crisis brought on by its growing reliance on wind and solar power. So when we're out here trying to stimulate the economy, create jobs, compete in the global marketplace, I mean, we have to have all of the above. And in my humble view, it's irresponsible trying to deliberately shut down fossil fuels, which is one of the base loads of our electricity needs. Um, w one of the comments that uh, you, you made, Mr. Graham, like uh, you had talked about the increasing cost. You, you were talking about the use of wind is not free, the increasing cost, and you specifically s mentioned system reliability. Would you just elaborate on that a little bit for me, please? Well, we get questions about reliability a lot, as everybody does. It's, it's crucial. I used to work for one of the largest grid operators in the country, and it always sort of seemed to me that the grid could sort of be viewed as taking from really a, a thousand sources or, or more uh, of energy uh, and then trying to meet aggregate, uh, aggregate supply with, uh, or aggregate demand with aggregate supply. So uh, wind energy uh, fit very nicely, I thought then and think now, uh, into that portfolio. Not as, you know, not a single bullet, not to run a whole system on, not to uh, be relied on um, by itself, but as part of that diverse portfolio. But, but what do you mean by, system, by uh, increasing the cost of the system reliability? Um, I think that uh, that comment was about uh, if you have a large grid operator like the one I described, you can add wind energy, uh, significant amounts of it, without the need for significant additional reserves. Yeah. There are reserves or backup capacity for all resources because any of the resources you've heard about today or, or on the grid uh, can go down, down from time to time. does not mean they are unreliable. does not mean I'm saying yeah. any of those resources are unreliable or, or uh or wind is, but uh, when they're operating, the grid can, can use them, and you need a good grid operator with the right tools to keep, uh, keep the system. Yeah, out. you know, in the fiscal cliff legislation, there was $12 billion of production tax credit for wind energy. And in your comments, you had mentioned that shale gas would not have been successful without equivalent types of production tax credits. Would you provide the committee with uh, a detailed analysis of, of what you were referring to with that comment. I'd be happy Please. to. Thank you very much. My time's expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gramlich, uh, wind power is uh, very important to my home state. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, there are 13, at least 13 international wind companies that are headquartered in Chicago. And last year, I'm sure you witnessed the battle in the Congress at the end of the year to extend the production tax credit. Uh, as many argue that wind is not really a viable source of energy, and investing in wind is not worth the money, money wasted. Uh, for this hearing, can you discuss the benefits of investing in wind on both the federal level as well as the uh, private level and what are some of the some of the advantages of investing in wind especially as it relates to job creation electricity uh, diversification and reliability and implications for addressing climate change and if, uh, I'm not sure I I was in India uh, a weeks ago, and we had a chance to visit the uh, DE uh, 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 facility there in New Delhi, New Delhi and we, uh, they showed us some technology that was, uh, that was uh, dealing with this issue of liability. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, is there technologies that are being developed? that would uh, address some of the issues around reliability. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I witnessed that, uh, that debate about the PTC in the last Congress. Um, uh, we, are, we are proud to uh, be saying with that extension, the industry is getting back to work and creating 
a lot of jobs, uh, 75,000 jobs in the industry. Uh, importantly, uh, we have really brought the manufacturing of the uh, wind turbines to this country. Uh, nearly 70 percent of the um, 8,000 parts in a turbine are made here. Um, we have nearly 500 manufacturing facilities around the country, including uh, in Illinois. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of the jobs that we are creating in, in our industry, as well as the rural economic development that, that our projects are creating uh, in the communities where wind is being developed, rural Illinois and, and uh, uh, much of the rest are, of the country. Are we exporting that technology? I'm sorry? Oh, exporting. Uh, not, not so much, but uh, in some cases, yes. Um, one of the great strategic advantages of... Uh, of wind energy is that these parts are very big, if you've seen them on the highway, which means uh, we have a great opportunity to uh, produce here what we deploy here. Uh, and that, that is a large reason why we have so much domestic production of this te technology compared to other manufacturing sectors that maybe are uh, shifting, shifting abroad in wind energy. Uh, it's most of, if we keep deploying it here, we're gonna be m making most of it here. How has the wind industry grown in terms of both generation capacity as well as private investment? And why is it important for policymakers to understand the trajectory of wind power and its potential for the future? Uh, as I said in my testimony, uh, the industry is responsible for about $25 billion in private investment in this country. Last year, that is investment that would not have otherwise occurred. Um, and uh, uh, there are um, significant uh, jobs that I mentioned before that are, that are uh, resulting from that. Um, and uh, the, the uh, tax credits have been, have been critical uh, to uh, keeping that investment going and, and um, hopefully they will continue. Mrs. Mr. Folks, uh, in the brief period of time that I have left. In your testimony, you noted that your facilities are on track to reduce carbon emissions by over 20% from the 05 levels uh, by the year 2020, while at the same time you've been able to maintain power prices at or below the national average. What kind of strategies have you implemented to achieve these goals and uh, are these measures uh, measures that can be replicated at other facilities? I, I think so. I mean, first we, we we're very fortunate to be in a very rich wind area, so that helps us with bringing in wind at a at a basically very competitive price. Our average wind portfolio is at forty dollars a megawatt hour, which is very close to parity with natural gas as an energy source. Second thing we did is we got started early. We started uh, repowering older coal plants that were relatively small, and we realized that uh, uh, the additional capital improvements wouldn't make sense in the long term. That said, we also built a new coal plant at the same time uh, a few years ago. It came online in 2010, which is very, a supercritical coal plant, very efficient, uh, and it allowed us then to retire those other older coal plants go to natural gas on some of them, and still have a good balance of fuel. So if you get started early, and we've been working on this since 2002, um, you can do things typically at a better price point than trying to do everything all at once, which is one concerns we see with some regulations is you try to do it once, you can find the labor, find the materials, et cetera. So, um, the combination of of effective, effectively of deploying in all of the above strategies, how we've maintained our competitiveness. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I want to make <coughs> a brief comment before I ask questions. I think it's important, not necessarily for this panel. I think they get it, but maybe for the audience that will review the record, uh, how important it is to have a robust energy market in America because we have based our energy policy generically on markets in this country, uh, today we've got a situation where America is literally uh, 
being uh, reindustrialized uh, in front of us. Uh, companies are moving back to America. Manufacturing plants are moving back to America. Jobs are being created in, in America. And I think a principal reason is because our energy markets are so robust and so diversified uh, that we've got the lowest uh, overall energy prices in the world. And uh, this committee uh, can take, take credit for that. Uh, we have consistently, you know, sometimes up, sometimes down, but overall uh, supported a, um, a market-based energy policy. With regards to electricity generation, this panel shows the diversity of the electricity. We have people that are proponents of nuclear power, coal plow power, hydropower, natural gas power. Uh, we've got uh, independent merchants. We've got regulated utilities. Uh, we've got municipal power. Uh, we don't have co-ops that I'm aware of uh, uh, today. But other than that, uh, uh, we've got it. We have the alternative energy market, the renewable energy market. So. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Rush, ranking member, y'all done a great job of putting this this panel together. Now, my first question is to the uh, gentleman from American Electric Power. Uh, the ranking member of the full committee in his opening statement said that the uh, new source power plant regulations that are being proposed by the EPA are fuel neutral. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, sir, I do not. Um, they uh, they are prejudiced toward a fuel and against another. Yeah, let's be honest. Uh, you're not going to build a coal plant with those those regulations, and you you'll build probably um, uh, almost all natural gas. I'm I'm in the Barnett Shale, so I'm not anti-natural gas. Right. But I also have lignite coal plants, and uh, I support nuclear power and wind power. Um, so I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say that they're they're fuel neutral. They're not. Um, the gentleman uh, from Entergy, you were a big proponent of nuclear power. Do you think it's possible in today's marketing environment to build a, uh, a baseload nuclear power plant in America? It is very challenging in this environment to be able to build a new, a new nuclear plant. Currently, there's uh, a handful of them being developed down south. Yeah, where they still have the regulated markets and you can roll in the prices and is 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 the challenge for new nuclear is it more still regulatory and licensing or is it just the simple fact that because of the competition from coal and natural gas and to some extent wind power possibly that it's it's just not cost effective right now it's not more economically possible well really there's there's three challenges as it relates to merchant nuclear um, low gas prices uh, obviously have uh, depressed the markets Regulation, we need fact-based, scientific approach that's based on cost-benefit, and we need fair and competitive wholesale markets. Uh, and so you're exactly right. Th that uh, trying to build a new nuclear plant in, in a wholesale market is just not feasible. Well, I want the record to show that we had a witness that I was exactly right. That's all <laughs> I make a note of that. I want to go to our, our friend that's recommending the, the wind industry. Um, Texas is a big wind state. I'm a big proponent uh, historically of wind power. What is uh, baseload uh, wind generation cost these days? What, what's a per kilowatt price? The price does vary by region. We have a great wind resource in, in your state. Uh, you can, the, uh, there are published um, contract prices uh, at uh, FERC. Uh, for wind power contracts, they. Uh, now, I'm not talking. About, I just want to. I'm not. This is not a trick question. I mean, you can build. You can generate coal and natural gas. I'd say three or four, maybe five cents a kilowatt hour. What What would be an equivalent cost for wind power in a perfect situation? Is it below ten cents? Five cents? Three and four contract in the uh, state and. Uh, the middle of the country. The right situation is fair to say that wind power can be competitive with other uh, commercial baseload sources. Is that a fair statement? It can be in, in certain, uh, <coughs> certain locations. Okay, my time is expired, but I would like record answer that's on, on the negative into a into a, a competitive market simply to get the tax credit. The uh, my, my coal producers and merchant natural gas plant producers in Texas say some of the wind producers 
bid negative simply to keep the windmills turning because of the, uh, the, the, the wind tax credit uh, basically gives them a, 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 a reason to, to give the power away. Uh, and my time's expired, but I'd like an answer to that, if you would, sir. With that, okay. I'll go back. Thank you. Um, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I really uh, think this is great testimony this morning. I filled my uh, note sheet with every one of your testimony, which is very unusual in a hearing. So uh, congratulations. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, before coming to Congress, I spent uh, years in the wind industry, which does make me somewhat biased, but uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the, uh, all of the above strategy, including nuclear. I love to see small modular reactors come online. It's a very good uh, concept. Um, and uh, I did have the opportunity in my career to work uh, with, uh, with Excel, with uh, OEA, and with uh, the Nebraska Public Power. So uh, it's, it was a great uh, opportunity to get to know some of your businesses. Um, uh, we often hear about the war on coal, uh, but withstanding some regional differences that were pointed out by Mr. McClure and Mr. Mole, uh, the war uh, on coal is really about uh, natural gas underpricing coal in most parts of the country. So. Uh, I hear that refrain often, but I, I, uh, I have a hard time swallowing it. Um, I have some questions, though, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Folk. Um, would you comment on the uh, system stability impacts of wind and solar energy in your uh, utilities? Yeah, it, it, the reliability issues increase, obviously, the more, yeah, it's on, the more renewables you have on system. Uh, I mentioned in my testimony at one point earlier this year we had 57 percent of our energy coming from wind. So when that happens, you have to quickly back down your generation. And typically you want that to be a gas-fired generation versus nuclear or coal because they're, they're designed better for those sorts of things. So you have to ramp up and ramp down and you have to follow uh, the load accordingly. Um, and, and that does as you get higher levels of penetration, increase the cost of having that much renew renewables on your system. Well, you mentioned that Excel is on track to reduce carbon emissions by 20 percent uh, with price stability. Would you describe how that's possible? Well, as I said before, I mean, it's really getting started early. It's, it's, uh, it's taking advantage of a very rich wind resource <laughs> in our backyard. It's, it's retiring. Uh, all, uh, aging coal plants that are probably beyond their service life, particularly with the environmental regulations ahead. So I would say it's an all of the above strategy to do that, but you get started early and you, it's steady and slow. Good. I like your answers. They're, they don't last too long, so I still have a little time left. I could ask tw 30 minutes of questions if, if I had the time. Um, how, how would you, uh, um, Mr. F uh, Folk, um, how would you, uh, how does wind energy form a hedge against price spikes? You know, it's a, that's a great question. Wind, as we all know, is interruptible. So we view it, while it has a capacity factor for planning, we put a very small capacity factor on. So it's fuel. So you can build it and you can determine how long it's going to, what it's going to cost over a 20-year period. For us, that's about $40 a megawatt hour. Then you compare that to other fuel sources, natural gas specifically. Yeah. Sometimes at $40 a megawatt hour, it's, it's in the money, as it was when natural gas was at 8 and $10. Sometimes it's a little bit out of the money, as it is today in a very low natural gas environment, but it's still a hedge. So and you're, are you investing in storage? Uh, at, at this stuff? point, with a low natural gas environment, storage is not uh, competitive. Okay. Mr. Gramlich, uh, would you elaborate on your statement that shale has benefited from reliable credits, whereas wind energy hasn't? Sure. I, I think Shale grass is a success story. As this committee is interested in bringing new options uh, to the uh, portfolio and, and uh, shale gas, uh, people get a lot of it, but uh, uh, it, it has uh, increased dramatically and changed the game in the industry. Uh, and also, certainly, the uh, tax credit was uh, played a key role in that. There was, I believe, over 20 years of stability in that credit, which helped a lot with investors. Our problem with Investors, we have many, many investors who would, as you know, and <laughs> you have the wind patent, I don't. Um, but as you know, investing in these technologies, um, uh, you could make a lot of cost-reducing investments and performance-improving investments if you knew what the market 
might be like a few years down the road. But if you only know a year or two at a time, it's very hard to justify those investments. So the stability of the credit is as crucial as the value in terms of cents a kilowatt hour. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCullough, could you quickly explain what SMR development is for nuclear? Uh, yes, it is the small modular reactor development that you okay. referenced. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. And my staff's bringing it. I, and I agree. I think it was uh, Mr. McClure, you mentioned this. This is in our uh, committee memo in the briefing chart. It talks about the regional differences. And I'm in the east, north, central, 63% coal, which is a lot different than if you go to California, which is 47% hydro and 27% natural gas. So the point being, the regions are very, very different. And if we don't have a, a diversified portfolio based upon the regions, some big wind areas, some areas, they don't have a lot of wind. Uh, and if we, in a public policy arena, move to really uh, disincentive base load generation, people are going to get harmed. Um, Illinois is a 50-50 state, 50% nuclear pretty much, 50% coal. Um, although we do have a lot of wind generation, it's still very small in the overall portfolio of, of, the, of, of the generation. Missouri, across the line, 85% is coal generation. Um, and uh, Mr. Barton did mention the price. I mean, it's still base load generation is the low pro price commodity product. Which gets, so, so people get harmed, and the economy gets harmed by high prices, which is really kind of the, the initial in my opening statement that I wanted to, to make. And just another point before I go to my questions, Mr. Gramlich, if you've got a zero fuel cost, how many jobs are there that bring that commodity product to that generator? My, my point is none, okay? Coal miners mine coal, take it to the power plant, good paying jobs, good benefits, tough work in, in the coal regions around the world. They're critical to uh, the Southern Illinois economy, the West Virginia economy, the Kentucky economy. So I, I like zero cost, but wind power is still a high cost generation, even though the fuel is no cost. And we do, we do lose the jobs. The, um, Mr. McCullough, um, the amount of coal used to generate electricity is decreasing. We've all admitted that, from 50% to 37%. What policy changes are needed to ensure that the coal continues to remain a significant part of our nation's diverse generation fuel mix? Yes, I think um, as we reflected earlier, and I actually would like to uh, qualify an earlier answer to the chairman's question around the legality of NSPS. Um, it, we, we would take the position as not legal because it's the first time EPA has required a technology that's not commercially available. Well, and I want to highlight that. There's three people who talked about supercritical power plants, uh, coal, the cleanest. Thank you for doing that. But if EPA rules on greenhouse gas ability, these brand new power plants, cleanest in the world, may not be able to operate. Is that true, Mr. McCullough? We could not retrofit Turk plant. The most because there's no technology. That is not commercially available. There are no vendor gates. And the other supercritical plants, do you agree with that, Mr. Falk? Yeah. It, Mr. Gherkin? Yeah. And that's part of the point that we're trying to make from the coal regions. Even though we have the best power plant in the world, greenhouse gas, we don't have the technology to even capture it. And if it is, it's gonna, the, the build-out of the, of the footprint is going to be in the billions of dollars, and it's going to take about 30 percent of electricity generation if you even had the technology. Um, Mr. McClure, let's talk about uh, this shift in natural gas. I'm all for it. But I think you alluded to, uh, just like an electricity grid and a transmission grid, we may have some pipeline constraints. And uh, you alluded to that in opening statement. Can you uh, talk that? Well, there's a recent example, a very recent example in New England that I think many of you have uh, become familiar with, where uh, high demand for electricity and a very old snap, uh, high demand for gas for uh, heating, uh, created 
uh, a real spike in, in prices for both natural gas and electricity. There are other parts of the country where we simply don't have the gas pipeline infrastructure. We could not convert our two coal plants to gas because there's no, not an adequate uh, gas line infrastructure there. And Mr. Graham, like that's some of the challenges of, of wind power on the reverse side just with the transmission grid, is it not? Transmission is very helpful. Just trying to wield that, that power to places that, that might be used. So those are, I think those especially issues um, in a bipartisan manner that we could talk about is uh, expanding our natural gas pipeline, expanding the, uh, the, the transmission grid. Um, and with that, my time has almost expired. I would just like to say we had a very good hearing on nuclear power last week. We talked about the uh, NRC and the filtered vent issue and how that's going to create new challenges. All we're going to ask the NRC to do is make sure before they promulgate rules, they go through regular order. Th those are additional ru uh, rules and regulations that are very, very costly. So I uh, yield back my time and now recognize... Uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I wanted to comment. Uh, in his opening statement, Chairman Whitfield cited a recent Wall Street Journal article that suggested wind and solar power threatened the California grid. There are a number of serious flaws with that article, but with the San Onofre nuclear generating station offline, the state could face some challenges this summer. This is something uh, I'm monitoring closely. Mr. Folk, uh, my understanding is that for a decade or longer, XL has been shifting some of its generation from coal to natural gas, partly in anticipation of eventual requirements to reduce carbon emissions. Can you tell us about the thinking behind that strategy? Uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Congressman. You're right. We've been doing it for a decade. These, these rules, we saw these rules come in, and, and we, at the same time, we had an aging generation fleet, natural gas, coal, et cetera. So our decision was to put the money into our, the, the coal plants that we thought could serve customers for another 20 to 30 years, at the same time retire those that we thought would not justify the, the incremental capital to serve customers for another 20 years, repower some of those plants, and, and then added to that uh, was the, our desire and, and the state mandate to add renewables. And so when you put all of that together, kind of an all of the above strategy, we were able to modernize the infrastructure, reduce carbon, and keep prices competitive at the mm -hmm. same time. Would you agree that regulatory certainty is vital and that climate legislation would provide that certainty? Absolutely, because we're, I, I, everybody in my position is making decisions on capital that are in the billions that we're going to live with for decades. Yeah. So you're, gonna, so you're never going to have perfect certainty, but regulatory uncertainty is probably one of the biggest risks we face uh, each and every year. Do you support a clean energy standard? I, we've, we've advocated, we believe it's inevitable there's going to be regulation. It's already here. And we think the important thing is that it's sensible and it gives time, it gives flexibility, and it gives that certainty that you talk about so we can get started on whatever the rules are. Thank you. Well, Excel is not alone in wanting Congress to provide regulatory certainty. Other companies represented on today's panel have been supporters of a range of policies to address climate change. Uh, Mr. Mole, um, Energy supports a tax on carbon pollution. Is that correct? We support some type of market-based price signal to, that to puts a price on carbon emissions. We believe that makes uh, a lot of sense. We believe that's better than a command and control structure. Uh, we believe that, that provides the incentive to develop new, cleaner technologies. Thank you. And uh, Mr. McCulloch, a AEP previously supported legislation to establish an economy-wide market-based system to reduce carbon emissions and continues to support a federal legislative approach to climate change. Is that right? We do support legislative pr approach over a uh, regulated approach, and uh, depending upon the details, would be very, very supportive. Uh, there's no question that the United States need to address climate change. The threat is not going away. Delaying act will increase the efficiency of the and, uh, AEP and AEL are some of the biggest utilities in the country. Together, they operate across the country. Do you all agree that the best way to address climate change is through legislation for, from Congress? And speaking from Excel, yes. Okay. Mr. Mullen. 
Uh, again, we we believe that whether it's legislative or, or uh, regulatory, that we do need some type of market-based uh, price signal in order to address that issue. We can only get that from Congress. <laughs> Mr. McCullough. And again, with the qualification about the details, we would, we would support it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, when utilities tell us they're looking for regulatory certainty, they're not talking about bills that delay action. They're looking for real action and thoughtful policies. They want Congress to establish the rules of the road so they can plan for the future and make the appropriate investments. Utilities want Congress to act, uh, to act, and I want Congress to act, but if Congress doesn't act, the President must do everything he can. When future generations look back on this time, they won't care whether we enacted my preferred approach or your preferred approach. They'll simply ask whether we acted before it was too late. This is the moral imperative of our time. We must address this challenge for the sake of our children and future generations. That's what the President said. I support what he said, and I hope we in Congress can get together and pass legislation rather than have, let, led, uh, have action imposed only through regulation at the executive branch. But if we can't get anything else, uh, I would welcome that regulation uh, uh, to uh, make sure that we reduce the carbon emissions. Yield back to my town, balance of my time. This time I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to uh, thank you very much for the uh, hearing today. I think it's very, very informative, and uh, I appreciate uh, all of our panelists for being here today. And uh, some of you know, uh, who are on the panel, know a little bit my district. I represent Northwest, West Central Ohio. And I have about, according to national manufacturers, about 60,000 manufacturing jobs. And it, it goes anywhere from light manufacturing to heavy manufacturing. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, small, small folks out there, big folks out there. But when I go out, and I probably since last August have gone through 200 facilities, businesses, schools across my district, and uh, when I'm talking to my, especially on the manufacturer side, that base load capacity is absolutely essential. And the two things I hear from the folks when I'm back home, well, I, there's four, but the two I'm going to mention right now, the number one issue that's always brought up is regulations. And the things that drive their costs and the things that prevent them from going ahead are regulations. And I'm going right into that next area is when we talk about energy costs. Because again, they cannot compete in this market today not just in Ohio or the Midwest, but across the world, if we don't have energy costs that are reasonable, that they can get out there and produce that product. And so it's absolutely essential. And as uh, uh, Mr. Shimkus pointed out uh, on the, the map that he held out about east, uh, north, central, Ohio is included in that area along with Illinois and Indiana and Michigan, Wisconsin. And we do. We, you know, we're looking at... Uh, uh, about 63 percent of our of coal being used in that uh, in that area, and even higher in parts of my area. So, if I could uh, start, uh, uh, Mr. McCall, if I in your testimony, you know, I, because it just jumps right out at me. Because when you're talking about that, uh, uh, on page on page nine of your testimony, you say uh, we're talking about the shutdowns of coal-fired plants that once these additional plant retirements combined with already announced retirements, it's likely that 20 percent of U.S. coal fleet will be shut down within the next few years. And the next, so I guess my first question is, you know, are we going to have uh, uh, energy at the same cost, or is, co or, or is energy cost going to have to go up for not only the, for you to produce, but also for that end user, for the manufacturer, the farmers in my district, and again, I represent the largest number of farmers, senior citizens, small businesses, grocery store owners, what's going to happen to that cost? That's a, a very good question and one that gets um, misinterpreted quite often. Um, the coal plants that we will retire are largely running today, and they're running because they are very competitive. Um, as they move out of the generation stack, it does mean naturally that those units higher stack generate uh, power and then any replacement capacity also obviously involves uh, capital cost and new cost of energy associated with that. So energy costs will go up as units retire. Well, and, and again, I think it's important right there because I think, as you mentioned, that a lot of folks out there think, well, we can switch over to something. It's going to be, you know, all of a sudden, voila, we're going to throw a switch and something else is going to happen. 
And, you know, we're very fortunate in the state of Ohio with the Utica Shale that's been that's been found, and uh, you know, we're all for you know a, 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 you know an all of the above strategy, which we've been pushing since 2008. But you know, it, it was mentioned a little bit earlier in the testimony, you know, uh, how you know is it economical, or can you even convert a coal-fired plant over to a natural gas plant? Um, we will be converting just a few plants to natural gas, uh, but that will be for capacity uh, reserve reasons, uh, not for, you know, overall energy economics. Uh, you lose some efficiency as these units are designed to burn coal and gas can't get steam temperatures to the same um, efficiency levels that, that it was designed for. So um, it's, it's not going to be a very... Um, efficient use of natural gas uh, as they, you try to meet the energy needs of your your this, uh, your jurisdiction. Thank you, Vice. Switch uh, real briefly and quickly to uh, Mr. Gherkin. And again, uh, with AMP, uh, especially in my area, with you know out my back door, I can see uh, the four uh, wind turbines that were first op in operation in Ohio, and then with the uh, the solar field over in Napoleon the gas uh, plan over in um, uh, Fremont. Uh, if I could just ask you uh, quickly, uh, do, you know, despite the, uh, the many benefits behind um, uh, hydro, uh, building the new projects are increasing, uh, increasingly difficult due to uh, new upfront costs. Uh, what are the you know, reasons for some of these costs, and can Congress do anything to alleviate that you know, f uh, for on an economic scale? Yeah. The the uh, hydro projects are very capital intense, as I said. Um, one of the problems is we started the permitting on the, uh, the, all these plants in 2005, and they'll come online in 2014 and 2015. And so the regulatory process is, is in need of, of reform. If you ask anybody, even big investor owners are saying they need the licensing and permitting streamlined. Um, we were in this process. I talked a little bit about the 404 permit and the 408 permit. We were the guinea pigs on the 408 permit. We're the first ones out of the block. We had four projects. Um, needless to say, it took, and, and each district handled it different, and you had to go from the, the district to, the, head, to the, uh, the division and to the headquarters and then back and back and back and back. Uh, to give an idea, we were permitting the last phase of the Prairie State Coal Plant in June of 2010, and then we were delayed on being able to, uh, to get the permit. I mean, excuse me, we were financing the, the Prairie State Project in June of 2010. We were waiting for the 404 permit to finalize the financing for the hydro projects, which was $1.3 billion. Um, we didn't get that permit till December 13th. If you remember, 2010 was when Build America bonds was available, and we were trying to get to market. We actually financed in, on, on the three days later. It cost us 60 basis points difference in that spread on a $1.3 billion um, bond sale. And so we need to streamline it. The core are good operators when you operate these plants. The core does not have a priority, and it's not their mission to develop hydro. I think uh, with NHA and a lot of other uh, interested parties, we are trying to streamline that process, but there, we would like to have some help there. Thank you. Uh, Gentlemen's time has expired. All right, time's expired, and I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our panel for being here. Um, in February of 2012, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission initiated a number of efforts to coordinate the fuel transition and minimize concerns from both electric and gas industries. FERC received stakeholder comments and hosted five regional technical conferences in 2012 to discuss gas electric interdependence, electricity to schedule communication, electric resources, uh, and reliability. Did any participate in technical conferences? And if you did, do you have any feedback? Uh, was FERC responsive to some of your concerns? Anybody participate? I, I did not part participate personally, but um, uh, someone from my staff did. Oh. And we are happy that FERC is uh, hearing the concerns. We await strong ac action um, toward the harmonization of the electric and gas industry. Okay. Anybody else? That has Same comment, on? comment for it. We believe that's definitely heading in the right direction, something that's on the long run. Okay. 
Mr. Folks, you testified that Excel recently added a large coal plant in Colorado and that you also are in the process of extending and updating three nuclear plants for another 20 years of service. Yet several of your colleagues on the panel testified to the market conditions that are making it difficult for coal or nuclear plants to come online. What's the secret of Excel's success? Well, I, let me just make sh to be sure. <laughs> I, I don't think that same plant today would, would be permissible under uh, under the rules and the political realities, but we had it approved. The same coal plants or the nuclear the coal plants? plants? The coal plants. Yeah. Um, so we basically had we, we started that uh, that process, I believe, around the 2004 time frame and started construction around the 2008 time frame. We were able to get that plant cited and permit it and avoid some protracted litigation because uh, we also were able to commit to do some things to clean up the environment. And so it was a good package and it went forward in our state and that was in Colorado. Um, I don't think that same deal could be done today. I, I forgot your second part of your question. Oh, just that uh, uh, if those, um, if what's different about your con company that was that you're doing compared to the other uh, witnesses we have? I, the only thing I would add, and I think everybody's trying to do a, a, the right job, but we've worked really close with our states, and that we've been very proactive at you know trying to anticipate regulation and other issues early, so we can get started early. Well, and I know my experience in Texas is doing the same thing. We try to uh, do that. Of course, I'm also. Well, for me, you know, I'm a, we're in the middle of the natural gas boom and the fuel shifting and, and obviously benefit. But I also know in, in our expansion with our South Texas nuclear plant, I would love to get more electricity out of nuclear power in Texas. Mm -hmm. We only have two, and the one that we lost because of one of the investors was Tokyo Power, and we know that story. But, you know, for our country, and I know it's difficult with the low price of natural gas right. uh, to, you know, because whether it's hydro or nuclear, it's upfront investments. And, uh, and it's just difficult to, to make that work, even with the loan guarantees. It's um, difficult. But um, although I have to admit, I read just over the weekend that in Europe, we're exporting a lot of coal, and it's displacing the natural gas that they're importing predominantly from Russia, because mm -hmm. natural gas is so expensive in Europe. And, um, but, uh, but again, location, location, location. Mr. Moe, you talked at length about the market conditions that are threatening nuclear power in our country. And you testified preserving the many benefits of nuclear generation depends more on than ever on rational and evidence-based regulation. Um, and I agree. Like I said, even though we're in a natural gas boom, uh, for for long term and carbon, the most carbon friendly is either windmills, solar, or nuclear. And uh, as much as I love natural gas and the success we're having, specifically, what regulations are impediments to uh, to new nuclear generation? One of the challenges we have right now is the uh, that we're looking at is the filtered vents discussion. Uh, yeah. What's required for the BWR technology? <clears throat> and uh, our point of view is that uh, that should be looked at on a plant by plant basis. And we don't need uh, it's, it's probably not necessary to have something that is just uh, kind of a rubber stamp that every plant well, needs to do. And, and I agree. And I think I signed a letter expressing yes, that sir. concern. It ought to look on a case by case basis. Absolutely. We may not need to change the filter on every plant, but. Uh, but it, it is. Is there anything else other than that? Uh, uh, nothing specifically. I mean, because a know, long time frame is just frustrating. It, it takes a long time to you know work through the relicensing issues as we're experiencing on several plants. Uh, again, the the three challenges we have are low natural gas prices. We need reasonable regulation, and we need fair and competitive wholesale markets so that we can continue to uh, to. Uh, you know, participate and, and, you know, we have to be financially viable uh, with these yeah. facilities to participate in these markets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to go back to Mr. Uh, uh, Gergen. Uh, you made some remark about that, uh, actually it was in your testimony, that only 3% of the dams, 80,000 dams across America, electricity. Uh, explain that a little bit. Uh, what's holding that up? Uh, one, one is very capital intense uh, projects uh, and they take some time to develop and a lot of these are not your big and dams obviously run river where we're at so they have smaller capacity nameplate but our projects are example 105 megawatts, megawatts 
72 megawatts and 48 megawatts. Um, and so from that perspective, our business model fits it pretty well. Also that uh, I will say in, in defense of some of the investor owns it, uh, some of these projects have uh, municipal preference on them. So if there's competing license and they're equal, they're gonna go to a municipal a system, uh, the municipal preference. But for the most part, it's that capital intense uh, uh, issue. What we've been able to do, what sets us apart, um, and, and I'm not sure we would build these projects today if it, you know, in, in the day's natural <coughs> gas markets, it would have been tough to justify this because, quite frankly, our, our run of the river hydro are very similar to the nuclear when it comes to cost. Um, okay. But we look at that component from we don't have a fuel to buy and a waste stream on the other side. Thank you. So I, I think that's the key. On, on some other matters, I'd like to hear, um, uh, coming from a coal state and, and um, seeing the pushback, I'm, I'm always, I chuckle over the, People say there's no war on coal. I, I just they they just live in a live under a rock if they don't understand that. And maybe we need to just talk more slowly for them. Um, but uh, as it relates to natural gas, um, eventually, and, and we're going to see natural gas rise in its price. We know that uh, right now. What the Henry Hub is about three and a quarter something. Um, where where does it reach a point? What, what, at what price? You all, many of you burn natural gas with it. When does it reach a price? Uh, what, what is that level? $6, $7 when you have to go back to Public Service Commission and, and, and ask for a rate change? What, what would be a, what's a reasonable expectation when we should be con become concerned about the price of natural gas? I'll take a shot at that. Um, all of our fuel costs typically is passed through uh, so I know that's I, precisely that's what I'm saying. So the consumer is ultimately going to pay for for using this. So I'm curious, what will that level be? What is the level that becomes a con yeah? So our average coal cost in 2012 at AEP um, was about two dollars and forty cents a million. So if gas were double or more than that, we probably would um, be called in to justify why we chose a certain um, scenario for building and uh, serving the jurisdiction. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of hypothetical, but um, certainly when you're passing through that much uh, increased cost, it raises awareness at the commissions and they'd like to understand What's why. The, uh, um, I know in the time frame, uh, maybe we don't have enough, to, but, but I'm hoping, and we're, 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 we've been discussing about global warming and having climate change, some hearings or so, that, that's a, probably a worthwhile venture of time. But um, I, I'm just curious from the, the two of you at the end, Mr. Mole and Mr. McCullough, the, um, do you believe that, that uh, I, I, I believe there is global warming going on. As an engineer in Congress, I believe there is some global warming, climate change occurring. But is my, my question to you though is, is it man-made? Uh, I guess l I'll take. I, a shot I don't want to let McCullough off the hook there, but we'll go back to you. So just yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's fine. I, I, you know, having we have utilities uh, in the Gulf Coast, and uh, you know, I, I think you could argue whether you know what what's creating the uh, issues associated with climate change, but the risks are real. I mean, we are face. We have seen a substantial increase in the number of hurricanes, the intensity of the hurricanes, and the damage to the to the Gulf Coast, and so. Really, the way we look at it is it's a reality, and we need to manage that risk just like we manage any other risk in our portfolio. So we look for opportunities to mitigate. My question, my question Mr. Moult, is it man-made? Did we cause it? I, 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 as I said, I am not the one to argue that, argue that point, or nor am I have the scientific background to answer okay. that question. Mr. McCullough, do you think, did, have we caused this? Well, um, great question. Again, I'm not a climatologist, but the incremental part Part of a CO2 emissions created by an, um, is an already overall CO2 emissions. Um, and when you look at it from a global perspective, and in my opening remarks, uh, here in this country, we are less than 12% of global CO2 emissions and get it all the time. So whatever's offered up as a solution needs to be global in nature and market based. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. You'll back my time. This time, I recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands. Is a Christian five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I wonder if I could get up on the monitor. 
Because before I ask questions, I want to share what the pie for the Virgin Islands would look like um, <laughs> compared to the map in the corner. And it's pretty much the same for all of the terri smaller territories, Guam, American Samoa, and Northern Mariana Islands. And we are working, you can put the other slide up, if we are working towards diversifying our sources of energy, but small size, distance, and other factors make it very difficult and, uh, compared to the states. And we don't have a grid that supplies electricity from other areas, so it's very difficult for us. But my, my first question, and it'll be a, a little bit different, we don't have nuclear energy, we don't have hy hydropower, um, and not likely to be able to move in that, those directions. But Mr. McClure, I see in your testimony that NPPD has been doing some planning over the last two years, and I, we've been talking about an integrated resource plan in the Virgin Islands, which I, some, is something that I believe is really needed. Could you speak a little about the process that you've gone through and describe some of the key components of, that the plan would consider? Well, and every utility up here goes through an integrated resource planning process. It involves uh, developing a number of scenarios. Uh, there's a lot of computer modeling that takes place, and, and obviously we have to make assumptions about the future, future of uh, fuel prices, of various types of fuel, uh, other things. And what you're trying to develop is looking both at the supply side and the demand side. How do you get the, the best result for your customers for the long term, a, a reliable, affordable price of energy? And again, it has a lot of regional aspects to it, but it also has national aspects as you look at various policies. Thanks. And we're looking at wind energy. We ha we have it. We're doing some solar, but um, haven't really um, moved towards wind yet. And so, Mr. Gramlich and Mr. Folk, um, Mr. Gramlich, you had said that. The grid operators have been able to reliably add uh, large amounts of wind energy to the system. And Mr. Folk, you, um, wind represents a large part of your portfolio. But for a place that doesn't have a grid that supplies energy from diverse areas like the Virgin Islands, uh, do you think that we could reach that same reliability from wind, and, or would we need additional river reserve capacity? I'm thinking that you know, we couldn't rely on it. Without knowing specifics, the smaller the grid, and the larger the one single source of wind would be, I think the more problems you'd have making sure that it's, it's integrated efficiently and reliably. Right. Because, um, Mr. Gramlich, I, I believe in an answering another question, you did say that having that grid backup is what really um, makes sure that you have the reliability. The grid helps a great deal. It makes it a lot easier. Thank you. I, I don't think I have any other questions right Oh, yeah, I do have one other. Um, about Hurricane Sandy, um, and I guess this was Mr. Gramlich. You talked about Hurricane Sandy and the fact that um, when you had that cold um, spot in Texas, the wind turbines continued to work. But I was wondering about, again, we live in a hurricane-prone area. So I was wondering if the fact that you were able to continue to provide wind uh, and electricity from the wind from wind power in the sandy hit areas was because when the wind turbines in the, those areas were still operating or did they come from a grid from the outside? Uh, well, uh, both in the, uh, in the area affected, uh, but I, I was making the point that diversity is critical and, and uh, what diversity brings you is whatever may affect one resource may not affect the other and you rely on this portfolio of diverse uh, sources of generation uh, so that hopefully you can rely on one if you cannot rely on the other. So both the wind sources in the Sandy Hit areas worked and also were supplied from the other? Right. Okay. And I just want, in closing, to just agree with uh, what our ranking member, uh, Mr. Waxman, said in the opening statement on the importance of climate change being a part of any energy conversation. We always focus on the cost, of course, of electricity production um, in these discussions. But it's also important to consider the cost of not reducing carbon emissions, the cost in public health, the cost in the storms. Mm -hmm. And when you throw all of those in, really the cost of electricity uh, uh, from uh, fossil fuels with high emissions, we're not able to control those. The cost is really much higher than what we usually um, represent as a cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Mr. Polk, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, as you know, my district in Colorado is a very diverse energy district. It spans from the New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming borders. Uh, so it's a, a state that has a, a tremendous land, a district that has tremendous land area and a state that has a great deal of energy diversity. Uh, my district alone has one of the nation's most promising oil and gas resource plays. Uh, it has uh, ethanol plants, about four ethanol plants, a number of biofuel, biodiesel plants. It has uh, solar manufacturing. It has wind manufacturing. It has a coal uh, mine. And so it really does have uh, present a truly all of the above energy strategy. I think I believe I have a, at least one Excel uh, power plant in the district as well. Uh, over the past several years, though, uh, the state legislature, along with uh, Governor Ritter, Go Governor Hickenlooper, uh, the Congressional delegation has worked on uh, the the Colorado SIP, uh, and I believe has the SIP. The Colorado SIP has bipartisan support. Uh, the entire Colorado congressional delegation uh, supports the the SIP. The uh, governor supports the SIP. Uh, the great bipartisan appeal. But recently, the National Parks Conservation Association and Wild Earth Guardians have filed a notice to appeal EPA's approval of Colorado's uh, state implementation plan regarding regional haze, and uh, Excel has been a, a great player in this, and Excel continues to support the, the SIP. Is that correct? We absolutely continue to support it. What do you think ends up happening? I mean, this is a, an idea that has such tremendous bipartisan support in Colorado. Uh, what ends up happening uh, with states like Colorado that truly do come together, uh, creating a SIP that is recognized by both sides as a step forward, and then you have uh, this litigation that happens. What do you think the end game is around the country for that? I, I think it's a model for how you can you can accomplish responsible and cost effective uh, environmental uh, leadership. And 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 uh, you know the fact that the EPA uh, agreed with that SIP program. And by the way, the same thing we're facing the same thing in Minnesota and have the same kind of lawsuits as well. I think it shows that. Same bipartisan you, you support. You have a bipartisan. You can get something done at the state level. You can get EPA to buy off on it, and you're still not going to make everybody happy. And that's just the way that that works. But it has been, I think, a model that we could look at going forward. Yeah. And we've seen tremendous development of natural gas in my district as well. And Excel Energy, uh, you're using that energy within uh, within the state of Colorado. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And wanted to talk to some of the other panelists. Uh, I heard the mention of, of hydropower as well. Uh, Colorado has a renewable portfolio standard, uh, but however, hydropower is considered uh, not to be a part of that. Very, I think micro hydro is, is considered to be a part of it, but nothing beyond on a large scale. Uh, if we were to see the inclusion of hydropower at a larger scale, uh, would we increase the opportunity to use hydro as part of a, a renewable fuel standard, renewable portfolio standard, Mr. McCullough? Yes, I think we would. Any incentive or motive to, to move forward with uh, hydropower would be helpful in, in moving it along. Mr. Mull? Absolutely. Mr. Folk? Yeah, I, I think so. Mr. Kirkman? Yes, I do. And I'll give an example is we have members in Michigan, and Michigan was moving forward with an RPS standard, and we had five municipals in Michigan that actually the state carved out specifically their participation in these projects we have. So I think you'll see some movement there. Most Very definitely. Good. I don't know, Mr. Graham, like if you want to answer that question or not. <laughs> Mr. McClure. Very good. Uh, the other question I would have is, is uh, to, to Excel Energy, you've been working on the customer renewables credit. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give me a, I only have a minute left, maybe a little explanation for the committee of, of that idea? Yeah, it basically incents and, and recognizes uh, that utilities that are, have a significant amount of renewables on their system do incur some ancillary costs. And the more you have, the more you incur. And it's, it's, it's to help those utilities and customers bridge some of this cost. It's a fraction of what the PC is now. Very good. Mr. Chairman, yield back. Thank you. I don't recognize this is Mr. for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome witnesses. Good afternoon. By about two minutes here. I appreciate your time and expertise. The state of Texas, Texas is like, like a whole other country. And we are, we are the market cousin of America's diversity, electricity generation. Texas, each region of the United States uses a mix of fuels to generate electricity, ranging from coal, gas, nuclear, hydropower, and renewables like wind 
and solar. And taking a page from the former chairman, Mr. Dingo from Michigan, from his uh, way he works here in the uh, committee, I'm asking all of you a question. Please answer yes or no. Start with you, Mr. McCullough. Is fuel diversity important to keeping energy prices low? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Mole? Yes. Mr. Folk? Got to go yes. Got to go yes. Mr. Gherkin? Yes. Mr. Gullich? Yes. Yes. Okay. Six yeses. Okay, here we go. Now, question two. Is fuel diversity important for reliable electric, electric service? Yes or no? Absolutely yes. Yes. A, a qualified yes. 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 Okay, 5.9 yes. <laughs> <laughs> is fuel diversity important for keeping lights on or storing electricity quickly during major weather events or natural disasters? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. 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 6.0, all right. And the final question, yes or no question, to ensure affordable, reliable electricity, should federal policy support fuel diversity? Yes or yes. no? Yes. Absolutely yes. Yes. Absolutely yes. 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 6.0, again, a total of 23.9. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> um, went to Rice University, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> The Lone Star State is the fastest growing state in the country. In a stat that matters in this town, the last census, the 2010 census, we picked up four new congressional districts because of our growth. We all know more people means more homes, more commerce, more industry, more need for electricity generation. ERCOT is the agency in our state that regulates most of the electricity in the state, about 90% of it. And they did a recent study that says we may have a power crisis by 2014 unless we have new power ge generation brought up online. We'll be short 2,500 megawatts is their estimate. If we have a, a heat wave like the August before last, we were over 100 degrees in every part of the state for over a month. If that happens again, we will have brownouts or blackouts. We need more capacity. And yet, any time... My state has tried to take steps to address this shortage with coal. The federal government, through EPA, coordinating with the environmental groups, has stopped these projects dead in their tracks. One such project was, is a proposed pet coke plant in Texas called the Las Brisas Energy Center. That's been stopped dead again by EPA after they slow walked the project for more than three years. Pet Coke is a byproduct from their farmings right there on the Gulf Coast. I'm going to have an op-ed in Tomorrow's Hill that details the set setbacks Las Brisas endured. EPA blocked the permitting process, even though the Texas State Agency, authorized by federal law to enforce the Clean Air Act, granted the permit to Las Brisas. Las Brisas would have been a state-of-the-art facility featuring a quote-unquote Polishing scrubber to limit sulfur dioxide emissions, a mechanism to collect particulate matter, and an activated carbon injection system to remove mercury, which would have ensured better air quality than some of the older plants on the Texas power grid. And yet, the environmental groups and EPA blocked it, putting reliability at risk for Texans. A very short question for you, Mr. McCullough, and you, Mr. McClure, Mr. Gherkin. In your opinion, is this treatment typical of President Obama's EPA? We do see very harsh regulatory um, action uh, against fossil fuels, yes. Mr. Clure? I would agree that uh, fossil fuels are a major concern. And finally, Mr. McCullough. I have Mr. McCullough, Mr. Gherkin. Yes, I believe. Okay, I don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, but it's pretty clear to me that President Obama is keeping his campaign promise, keeping his word. He said, this is going to cross the of you in the Sunday. night. This is a quote. If somebody wants to build a whole power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all the greenhouse gas that's being emitted. I yield back to my time. Thank you. This is recognized from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <clears throat> thank you to the witnesses for being here today. We appreciate it. Uh, 
Mr. Mole, I want to thank uh, I want to thank you for being here, and I, I want to echo some of the comments that I've uh, that I've heard from power companies in Illinois. It, it's interesting to me who would have imagined that ten years ago we'd be seeing the impact that an supply of gas would have on our electrical grid. Uh, my district's home to eight nuclear units, and uh, Illinois gets half of its power from nuclear. Mr. Mole, if the price of natural gas stays at its current market price of four dollars a unit. Will nuclear maintain its 20% share? And if not, why not? And what can be done to ensure a diverse energy supply? Well, as I mentioned, the three challenges we face from merchant nuclear, which y you have uh, in Illinois, uh, the low gas, price, uh, low gas prices, uh, which have suppressed market prices. We need reasonable, fact-based, scientific regulation that uses cost-benefit analysis, and we need fair and competitive wholesale markets. So there are a number of things that really have to happen for these plants to be able to continue to operate. What can we do? So, do you, I mean, do you have any ideas offhand? So you're going to continue to have natural well, gas Well, I mean, price? natural gas prices are what they are. We have to deal with that situation. I mean, that, that's part of the market. Uh, where we have opportunities is to make sure that when we uh, look at imposing additional costs, for uh, whatever reason that may be. Regulations, that, requirements, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, right, that that, you know, we take a scientific approach, it's fact-based, and we use cost-benefit. When I say cost-benefit, I don't mean doing things on the cheap. Sure. What I mean no, I is we're looking at the best alternatives. And we'd like to see the NRC, for instance, and implement cost-benefit rules and analysis. It'd be, that would be nice. Uh, and then lastly is, you know, we need competitive wholesale markets. And, and they need to be free markets so people have the opportunity to earn a return on their investment. Now, let me ask you, too, you state in your written testimony that throughout the nation, nuclear generators help keep wholesale electricity prices lower than, the other, than they otherwise would be. Can you, can you further explain Well, that? sure. We talked about it. Uh, nuclear generation operates at a 90 percent capacity factor. It's uh, high capital investment, low, low incremental fuel. So they're the first, one of the first resources in, in a stack. And, and so they operate uh, very efficiently, and they operate uh, a significant portion of the, of the time. And so that's what makes them attractive. And that's what's keeping companies like yours competitive in this environment. Yeah, I mean, it, it does, give, you know, but keep in mind the challenges that I mentioned. Those are, those are still challenges, even though they are baseload resources. Understood. Uh, and for everybody, is having a fuel, a diverse fuel mix ranging from fossil fuels to renewables, critical for long-term planning. Do you need diversity to protect against unforeseen fuel shortages or disruptions? We'll start over there, sir. Unequivocal, unequivocal yes. Absolutely. Very helpful. Yes. 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 It's not a big surprise. Um, is having a diverse fuel mix uh, important for keeping electricity affordable? Yes. 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 Everybody's got their yes hats on. It's good. When electricity rates rise, are the impacts likely to be greatest for lower income consumers or those on a fixed income or higher income consumers? When you look at uh, the percentage of uh, discretionary spending that people have, it's obviously a bigger impact on lower income. It has a huge impact. And I think you would all agree. We just wanted to get that out there. And when electricity rates rise, can it also affect manufacturers and other businesses that are large energy consumers? We talk about manufacturing in this country. It's very important in my district. Um, does a higher energy cost, energy price, and so when we talk about EPA regulations, nuclear regulations, will that affect our business climate here? I think it absolutely could and will if uh, we don't have the diverse portfolio that supports balance and stability in future of energy price. Don't you wish I was your teacher in high school? It'd be easier. <laughs> Pass every class. Uh, with that, with that, Mr. Chairman and the witnesses, I want to say thank you, and I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. There's a gentleman from Louisiana. At this time, recognized for five minutes. One from Louisiana, Dr. Cat for five minutes. Hey, gentlemen, I'm sorry to be uh, at the very end. Just when you thought, man, it's over. Over. <laughs> I apologize. Um, oh, like a bad date that won't end. Uh, 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 Mr. Um, thank you. You mentioned um, 
removing fossil fuel as a fuel source will increase cost. Clearly, there's a move, move by a variety of mechanisms to decrease our use of coal, our most plentiful fossil fuel. Um, and saying that that would have negative effects on electric reliability cost in the economy. Uh, I see increased utility cost as decreasing manufacturing jobs, if you will, energy-intensive manufacturing jobs. Can you comment on that? Because I think there is a push either through carbon tax or through EP regulation or through a variety of other mechanisms to remove fossil fuel from its relative portion of our balance, uh, almost kind of – uh, agnostic or inconsiderate of the uh, impact it will have on the overall economy? Well, on our system, uh, one of our, our largest coal plant, we have two coal plants, is our lowest cost generating resource. And we have a, a new core steel plant in our system. They came to our system because of low cost energy. And they are very much concerned as energy prices go up, uh, they become less competitive and they're competing in a global market. So there's been a consideration of a carbon tax. Obviously, that is a way to price electricity from fossil fuel at a higher level relative to whatever other source you go to. Now, is it fair to say that would have a negative impact upon new cores ability to hire blue collar middle class workers? If if their costs go up, it, it affects I'm sure it affects their operations and their decisions and who, who they can hire. And by definition, energy-intensive enterprises are energy-intensive. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> okay. Um, and, um, and do I know that Nucor is actually a European firm? No, Nucor is an American firm. I think they're headquartered in North Carolina. Is it? No, I think I recall once they were considering building either in Brazil or the United States, and I'm sure uh, uh, energy costs must have played a role there. My understanding is they have 60 facilities in the United States. Gotcha. Okay. And then you speak of the diversity of fuel sources provides lower electric rates. Uh, yeah, I think that's in your testimony. Um, when you say diversity, uh, I've always been concerned that if, if you look at the premium the taxpayer pays to subsidize some renewables, the, we're actually paying a heck of a lot for things like wind and solar, not saying that we shouldn't. Uh, encourage their use, but at the same time, the cost per megawatt is almost exponentially higher than that from fossil fuel sources. Can we really build a grid based upon such expensive electricity? Well, again, I would come back to the notion of diversity. Uh, there are certain parts of the country where wind is very competitive because uh, uh, great wind conditions, and so those can be very low cost. That can be a low cost source of generation, and as as has been mentioned earlier. It can uh, help stabilize future costs because the fuel cost really doesn't change. But it's regional, like so many other issues we've discussed today. In some areas, wind can be a, a very valuable asset. In other areas, it's not even a, a, a viable possibility. Now, when you say that, obviously, there's incredible <coughs> subsidies involved with per, per um, megawatt hour involved with, say, wind. Uh, so when you say it's um, total life cycle cost, I'm just asking, I don't know the answer, I'm asking to learn. Total life cycle cost, um, if you factor in those subsidies, is it still a good bargain? I think we're learning a lot in wind. Uh, the price is coming down, and uh, the early wind projects we've put in, we've decommissioned. But the equipment today is much better. And uh, I think they'll continue to be the newer equipment, I believe, in the right locations uh, will be valuable over the long haul with the subsidies. Yes. Okay, gotcha. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casty. And uh, that concludes today's hearing. I want to thank uh, the panel of witnesses. We appreciate your expertise and your time for joining us today. And uh, I, I would also ask unanimous consent that the following materials and statements be entered to the record, a statement for the record from the American Public Association, and a statement record from American Chemistry Council. And uh, Mr. McClure, I certainly want to thank your company for their involvement in the Alliance for Fuel Options, Reliability, and Diversity Report. And, uh, and all the uh, Wall Street Journal article on the California grid and the New York Times article on the New England uh, gas price uh, uh, situation as well. The record will remain open for a period of 10 days, and uh, uh, Mr. Gramlich and others will be in touch with you all about some 
additional information that we ask that you all provide. But thank you again. Our hearing will be uh, on the subject related to the RTOs in the next couple of weeks. But uh, thank you again, and we're working with all as we move forward to try to keep America competitive in the global marketplace. Thank you.